I'd like to start by acknowledging um, the Yuan people, who are the traditional custodians of the lands where I am located today, in beautiful Jarvis Bay. I'd love to also extend and acknowledge, um, extend my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands where you are all located today. I'd like to acknowledge their continued connection to culture and country and thank them for looking after the places that we all get to call home today. Um, I also extend my respect to any Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander people or any other First Nations people who are with us on the call today. Sovereignty has never been ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Alrighty. Hi, everyone. Wonderful to meet you. I'm going to kick uh, things off and um, we're going to try between the three of us, between Lena, uh, Lena, between me and, and Carly, um, to give you, I guess, uh, a bit of a, a flavor, a bit of a taste of our different perspectives. Um, so me coming in as a, you know, essentially a consultant, having worked uh, with your town for actually almost like two years now you know, on different projects um, and having her particular perspective, long history, uh, working across different um, projects and Carly as well as, you know, being a um, council at Kids, Kids Helpline in the past and working in, in lots of other interesting spaces, now being firmly grounded in service design. So um, we're hoping to, you know, hand back and forth a little bit, um, presenting different uh, slides and different viewpoints. And then in the end, um, we've got a little bit of a, um, I guess, conversation between the three of us happening um and a little bit of a reflection uh part of um question around um the practice and, and what and so i'll be for opening up um more for q a but yeah please feel free to jump in um at any point in time um and yeah looking forward to starting the convo um so let's kick off with an acknowledgement um, of country from your town's perspective. Um, we'd like to acknowledge traditional owners uh, and custodians of country throughout Australia. Your town um, is, of course, all over um, Australia and um, recognizes their continuing connection to the land um, and waterways. We pay our respects uh, to First Nations peoples, their culture, and their elders, uh, past, present, and emerging. So I'm on Nanawa country today and um, also visiting um, this beautiful place called Canberra and um, want to, of course, extend my um, respect and acknowledgement to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge and recognize the individual and collective expertise of those uh, with a living or lived experience of mental health and in particular young people. So on that note of young people, let's introduce you to the service redesign team of your town. Now, this is, I would say, an eclectic and loose um, collection of wonderful human beings who all come from uh, many very different uh, backgrounds. Um, young people who you will see hopefully more prominently here than, than us oldies, um, who are part of different um, facets of the youth participation, uh, team and, and teams and groups uh, within your town have been established for quite a while now um, and who are now jumping into I guess the semi semi professional path of uh, becoming a designer and being a designer and there's also a few more young people that I'll introduce you along the way but um, yeah from left to right you kind of see the the core team there um, and then uh, down the bottom we have our call um, facilitators in some of the projects will come back uh, to them. So yeah, it's a it's a varying um, and very passionate um, and interesting group of people who work with us on various redesign uh, projects. So before I hand over to Anne uh, and Carly, I'm just going to share a couple of more words around what we're planning on sharing today. So we'll give you a bit of a very be a brief intro uh, to your town in, in case that you're not familiar with it. Um, but today we'll focus mostly on our experience of redesigning uh, two of the many, uh, very many uh, services and kind of redesign um, agenda that your town is embarking on and that 
uh, specifically Kids Helpline Redesign and Mental Health and Wellbeing um, Blueprint or, or Service Redesign. And we have a particular lens, you know, as the, the topic uh, says and, and suggests, have a particular uh, interest and focus talking about how the organization is um, involving more and more young people and um, handing over power, so to speak, in design and, um, you know, hopefully uh, going on kind of in more structural ways, uh, evaluation and so on. Uh, so we're hoping to tell that story from that angle. Uh, now, unfortunately, um, two of our um, young people couldn't be with us today. We were hoping they would be able to uh, join, but we will introduce them uh, nevertheless as, as we um, go through. What we thought we might do is um, Jax will share uh, a way to kind of um, communicate with them offline. So if you have any questions specifically to them, uh, please, um, you know, uh, get in touch with Jax and we will pass it on and then that way hopefully can establish a direct channel. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Sorry to interrupt, but we can use the chat. Um, I'll send, um, I'll make a Google Doc and um, share the link to everybody on the Humanitics registration form. If you were not on that form, put your name in the chat and I'll make sure you get that link too. Thanks. Awesome. Brilliant. Okay, so on that note, uh, let's kick off with uh, talking a little bit about your town. Thanks, Lena. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I, I, I think probably um, this is a good point at which to let you know a little bit about your town and and uh, the services that we have for those of you who are less familiar with us. Um, your town, um, we are a national organisation primarily because of uh, our Kids Helpline service, uh, which of course uh, provides 24-7 uh, support and counselling services to children and young people from 5 to 25 across Australia. So mental health and wellbeing support. Uh, we have a range of other mental health and wellbeing services, um, such as our um, Starfish program here in Queensland, um, which uh, and our Mind for Kids program, which is funded by PHN. Um, and uh, we have a range of employment and social enterprises. Our social enterprises are focused on activities like landscaping, construction, asset maintenance, and so forth. And we've been operating our social enterprises for quite a long time now. We're pr probably one of the, the longest standing um, you know, work uh, integrated social enterprises um, around, probably since 1990-ish. Um, we run a, a range of programs for children and families. Um, so we have a uh, domestic and family violence service, uh, and we have a service in Sydney, which is um, established uh, to support young parents uh, with young children. Uh, so we have a residential facility with up to 16 families at a time uh, and uh, they tend to be families where the child is at risk of removal. Uh, so lots of complexity there. Um, we have our advocacy and research team uh, that uh, does what it sounds like. Uh, they uh, do a lot of work in the research um, area, um, were instrumental in uh, a program called Your Voice in which we heard from young people across Australia um, in last year, um, a range of whole, around a whole range of topics um, that uh, were relevant to young people and we made sure that government heard their voice uh, as a result of that process uh, and that will be an ongoing thing. So um, our focus is uh, placing young people, uh, children and young people um, and the world they live in at the heart of everything we do uh, and I'm sure that's you know a, a familiar uh, idea to, to many people that are here today uh, in the not-for-profit sector. 
Um, just a, a few stats there to the side, you'll see um, 2,000, sorry, 260 odd thousand counselling and support responses uh, via Kids Helpline, Kids Helpline at school, which is a video conferencing into classrooms arrangement, Parent Line, My Circle. These are things that I won't go into, but they're all aspects of our virtual service delivery. So lots of contacts there, that's in the space of a year. Uh, and uh, 17,000 young people participating in our employment services, which are all youth specific. Uh, and two, two, sorry, 2,800 children and, and families involved in our child and family programs, 277 social enterprise participants, a smaller number because we're actually um, employing people for at least six months in those, um, in, in, in various roles in Queensland, New South Wales and South Australia and Tasmania. So there's a lot going on, it's diverse. I'll skip to the next slide. And uh, so we are on a bit of a strategic journey um, and uh, it's very, very busy uh, just now. What we're hoping to achieve is to help young people, more young people in more meaningful ways. So essentially we wanna do what we do better uh, and we want to reach young people where they are, provide a safe place, uh, an accessible place and an empowering place, whether it's virtual or physical, for young people to access the support they need, young people, children, families. Um, so we're working on our services strategy to meet the um, needs of our clients, which is aligned to changing needs, um, integrating services better, providing as much choice and control to young people as possible, um, and you know making sure that um, we're we're a service that they actually want to engage with. So it's a positive and effective experience. Uh, and those are our focus areas. Now we've narrowed our strategic focus areas down to mental health, domestic and family violence, early childhood, child protection and unemployment. And that doesn't sound very narrow, I know, but that's, it is narrower than where we have been. So I think we'll move to the next slide. Yeah, thanks for that, Anne. Uh, this is just a, a deeper dive look at those specific services, some of which Anne's already mentioned, so I won't go through them specifically. Um, but I will draw your attention to those in green being the ones that we've already undertaken a redesign of um, through uh, and which we'll share with you a little bit more today, specifically about Kids Helpline and our mental health and wellbeing services that sort of fall under that, um, that sphere. Um, prior to that, though, we did uh, redesign our transition to work program, our employment based program for young people. Um, and we also focused on redesigning our transitional housing service as well, which um, holds a, a service in both Queensland and New South Wales. And it's been a bit of an evolving journey. They were the earlier ones um, and with the later ones that we've undertaken, including the Kids Helpline and Mental Health and Wellbeing, we've had more youth involvement and participation. So we'll be sharing that more. And then lastly, um, our next redesign um, will be focusing on our residential service um, in, out in Sydney. It's called San Miguel Residential Service. So that will be occurring um, after this one. So we're very busy and we're slowly making our way through all the Your Town services. Okay. So uh, moving on to youth participation, which I, which I think is the flavour of this uh, presentation, really. Um, <clears throat> we, um, we think that, um, you know, that, exp that, that um, slogan that sits within the, or started, I think, in the disability sector, nothing about me without me is really applicable in terms of working with young people as well. Uh, we want to make that real, but we also want to, um, you know, step things up and let young people lead the way uh, rather than having, you know, you know just uh, things done to them. We want to do, we, we want young people to tell us what they need and to actually lead us in the right direction. So the um, uh, youth participation network is something that has evolved over the last couple of years. Um, 
it is surprising to say that up, up until a couple of years ago, we really didn't have a youth participation strategy in place um, or any um, channels, formal channels for young people to uh, tell us what they thought apart from feedback. So um, we have now got a quite a diverse um, and active uh, group of young people uh, across Australia. So it's not just we are based here in Brisbane, but our network is, uh, is much wider than that. There's a lot of online interaction with young people. Um, so, you know, this is an opportunity for young people to um, give their time, energy, lived experience, critical thinking and dedication to, you know, support um, better futures for other young people and advocate for the changes that they want to see in their own communities. Um, we have been involved in all kinds of amazing things. I'll, I'll just mention that this weekend coming, we have uh, a, a, an Our Pride group art show. So that's LGBTIQ plus young people who have um, organized, arranged, conceptualized and, and, and uh, uh, running an art show this weekend in Brisbane. And we've got 40 entries uh, from young people across Australia into the art show. So, and we've got queer bands and it's all, it's all happening this weekend. But that, so that's a, one of the community events. Uh, influencing policy, for example, our safeguarding policy, we've had young people go through our safeguarding policy before it was finalized with a fine tooth comb, make sure uh, that there were changes that, you know, uh, the changes that they wanted, um, actually occurred and that that happened um, you know providing um, doing presentations to our CEO and our board members and executive team about uh, issues like long-term unemployment and transition from school mental health um, making safer places for young people from diverse communities advocating for positive change etc cetera, etc cetera. So at the moment, we've got a few different youth advisory groups, um, and, and this is a bit of a, a moving beast, but we have a First Nations youth advisory group, a lived experience network. We have, as I mentioned, our Pride youth advisory group and our Abilities, which is a disability focused youth advisory group. Um, and we have a lot of young people who aren't actually in advisory groups, but are just part of our network and they participate as and when they can. Next slide. So um, in terms of service design, we, we've come a long way in a short period of time um, with uh, improving the level of youth participation in service design. So um, when we started uh, this process, we started with transition to work, uh, the redesign of transition to work and a domestic and family violence transitional housing um, program uh, and at that stage we would really we just did interviews with service users and we had some focus groups with service users and staff but with kids helpline we were able to step up um, our involvement um, and the, the the level of participation of young people so we recruited young people through the youth participation network we trained young people as co-facilitators so that when we ran online forums we had young people who were actually um, co-facilitating uh, breakout rooms uh, and sessions with young people operating Miro boards and doing all sorts of wonderful stuff. Um, and these young people uh, then helped to co-facilitate online workshops with young people, as I've just said, and uh, helped us to develop the Imaginarium concept, uh, which Lena will talk a little bit more about later. But uh, you ha I have to say, having young people in the room, uh, uh, in the online breakout room with other young people made a huge difference in terms of young people who were participating and their willingness to speak frankly about what was on their mind. Um, mental health and well-being. So we um, then stepped up uh, to another level and actually employed two young people as service design associates. And unfortunately, those young people can't be here today, but uh, I'm sure they, they would have um, been here if they could. There were some things that happened in their lives as, as happens. Um, so we, we actually um, brought 
two young people into the team uh, in these paid roles. And at the same time, call us crazy, but uh, we initiated a, a film internship opportunity for another group of young people. Um, and we partnered with a local um, youth led uh, film uh, studio called Creative Angle. Uh, and that film studio is actually at this point in time working with a group of, I think it's seven young people, um, training them in making documentary making, and they're actually making a documentary now about the service design process. So I can't wait to see how that one turns out. Um, and so the Imaginarium concept, um, which is essentially a, a design lab, both in physical and virtual space, um, we uh, are looking, we, we had a flood, you might recall here in Brisbane and we lost our ground floor entirely and it's still missing, um, but we're hoping that we will have uh, some builders back soon uh, and we will be creating uh, a, essentially a youth participation space, which will function as a design lab slash Imaginarium where young people uh, will be able to do a lot more of this uh, design work with us and have a space, uh, a safe space to do it. Um, and my hope is that eventually we could look at uh, creating a social enterprise uh, where young people uh, support or, or work with other organisations who are looking to do some participatory design work. So on to the next. Yeah, awesome. I might also just um, comment on that as an outsider, you know, I do work uh, a lot with other organizations and just want to, I guess, give a shout out. Uh, also looking at the, the comments in here around, um, comments in our chat around, you know, uh, ensuring that um, these were paid roles for young people, I think. Uh, in any other organization, probably wouldn't have been able to pull that off. But I feel because uh, your town already had such a good practice and, and such good relationships with young people, there was a lot of trust and also a lot of agility in, you know, everyone is on the same page. Everyone understands the importance of fairness and giving young people um, a goal and at the same time managing that with safeguarding and you know ethics protocols and so on so the you know it's everyone aspires to of course you know to have a lived experience workforce and you know do core design properly and all those things but when it hits the ground the organizational reality um it's a it's an entirely different story and uh i think it really speaks to the strength of the team um, and kind of the muscle that was developed over the years that we were able to transform sort of the practices so quickly. Mm. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually very hopeful that, you know, we can bring our vision of a social enterprise to life. And um, also, I, I mean, part of that, we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but I think part of our collective vision for the Imaginarium is that we also share the learnings um, with the sector and that we can do more of this stuff together. So, yeah, so that everyone can benefit. Um, I'm mindful that we are a little bit uh, short on time. So I might uh, just do a quick intro into the actual nitty gritty. So we're gonna to talk to you today about two um, of our projects and just, uh, I guess, sharing a little bit um, of the learning curve for the team when it comes to uh, not just designing um, and co-designing the projects, um, the redesign in itself, but also the involvement um, of young people as part of that. And so the first one that I'll uh, talk to is, or that I'll give an intro to is, is uh, Kids Helpline. Mm -hmm. And that's where we, uh, as Anne was just saying, uh, involved young people as co-facilitators. And, you know, that was not um, a paid role, but there was a training component to that. So we always uh, were looking uh, over how can we build skills and how can we really build the, the, the ground to later on then engage uh, people in uh, paid roles and, and so on, because it, it all takes time and build, building capability as well. Um, so the challenges for, I mean, you 
might know that Kids Help Fund is the flagship uh, program um, of your town, kind of the, the biggest brand, I guess, um, from all the services. And it's actually a pretty brave uh, step trying something new uh, in, you know, entrusting the team, the, the, the main kind of brand of, of your town to redesign it, but redesign it in a very different way. And that is in a human centered way um, and really being led by insights from young people with young people making sense together of it and letting them lead uh, the engagement of research sessions. So at the forefront of um, how we framed the design challenge uh, for the redesign of Kids Helpline uh, were four things. And um, with a bit of a long-term view, one of them, or the, probably the central one um, for me at least, was how can the service equip young people with advocacy and design skills to actually redesign the service themselves? So acknowledging that um, Kids Helpline uh, should be a service that's owned by young people, if you will, and that it will uh, change and evolve as technology changes, as you know, community uh, kind of models um, change, perhaps, um, uh, yeah, geographically, there might be different uh, kind of changes happening. So uh, Kids Helpline will need to respond and the best people to, to respond to that in terms of service design are young people. So that was really um, a core design challenge there for us. Um, and then, um, of course, going into the nitty gritty of the design itself, um, there's a spectrum of barriers and needs, as you can imagine, uh, one of them being, you know, if you just imagine that um, it's a service that needs to um, offer something, you know, from the five-year-old who calls for the first time, doesn't even know how to use maybe a phone or, you know, how to how to text yet, um, to a 25-year-old who, um, you know, may come regular and um, has more complex uh, challenges perhaps and uh, kind of has a, has a structured plan around it. So that's a sort of gamut of challenges and not even talking about uh, kind of more structural disadvantage um, or differences um, in terms of the design. So the design in and of itself of the service is quite complex to do justice to it, but we added, I guess, the cherry on top to actually change the process of how we design services in and of itself. Um, yeah, in, in that way. And then, of course, you know, how can we reach underserved young people um, who, who are missing out on Kids Helpline? And, you know, there's certain statistics that perhaps we can talk about another time, uh, young men being uh, one of the groups. And um, again, like that piece around uh, how can we build a service that uh, has good learning loops in it and, and how does that all feed in at a system level in terms of evaluation and funding and so on. Uh, so let's have a look at what the journey actually looked like. It's pretty crazy. So we mapped our emotional uh, journey through those months and the flood that Anne just mentioned was part of that. Um, so you can see there was uh, a lot of uh, going back to previous work. Um, your town had commissioned a piece of research that I led um, engaging with around 600 uh, young people around Australia in, in qual research around help seeking. So we used a lot of that material. Um, there's a lot of uh, mapping, uh, consulting with other helplines around the world. And then um, also we did, uh, of course, lots of workshops that uh, was led by the young people. So we trained them up. You can, so you, you see there's so many different layers um, just in redesigning the service. And then we had that extra layer around uh, training young people, being co-facilitators and then doing that in a, in a, in a proper uh, way with, with integrity. Um, we also had a uh, lovely face-to-face -face, um, interactions with young people. So for example, we had a group of um, year three, a year three a primary school class in Beechmere um, that we co-designed uh, with and um, yeah, uh, particular engagements around or with um, First Nations communities and, uh, you know, kids as young as I think seven was the youngest. Um, so we had special uh, kind of sessions with them and their parents. And so it, it was a good um, proper uh, process that had integrity. 
And um, the extra layer that was wonderful to see is to build really the capability of us as a team, as a service design team, and of young people to be able to come in and, uh, you know, quite quickly really wrap their head around the subject matter and then contribute to that. So, uh, yeah, I'll let um, Carly talk a little bit more now about actually the people who helped us with that. Yeah, thanks, Lena. I guess we just want to put a face and, and show recognition to those young people um, who were our co-facilitators and we have them here on the screen. Um, and they were generally recruited from our youth participation network, so had some involvement already. Um, but really saw them grow and learn so much from being part of this process. In particular, um, just to share a quick story about one of them, Jamie, who's the first person on the screen there, um, had spoke about the confidence that they had gained from being involved in our co-facilitation and that contributing to them being able to secure a job as a disability worker and reflecting that they didn't think that might have been possible if they didn't have that sort of involvement in, in being part of our process of um, talking with young people on the online workshops and and using those co-facilitation skills, I suppose. So that was just a really lovely outcome and we had really positive feedback from all of the young people involved. Um, they were compensated for their time as well. So, um, so we had gift vouchers that we um, able to share with them for participating. Um, so in saying that paid roles, of course, are, are sort of the best, but we were able to compensate them for their involvement as well. Anyone else want to add to that from my team before I move on? I would just say that, um, you know, Jamie is one example of, um, you know, uh, growth out of the process. Uh, but I think if you look at all of those young people on screen, um, they've all grown in different ways and made some decisions about their future journey that um, directly relate to their experience on this project. So, yeah, mm. it's been yeah, powerful. Sorry, I was just yeah. going to quickly say I was really surprised by the impact that it had on them. Yeah. Um, I suppose from my perspective, I was thinking, oh, it's, um, you know, we're just doing a little bit of co-facilitation and sort of it's a, a, a journey um, to um, learn some skills and so forth. But it, it meant so much more to them than I expected. So that was a really powerful take home message for me. Mm. Sorry, Lena. And I, I want to add to that, that um, most of these, if not, uh, yeah, almost all of these um, young people that you see here, they had, uh, so they were service users um, of uh, your town at some point in their life or, um, you know, some ongoing, I think, um, also for, for a number of years. So, uh, yeah, there were people, there are people who have uh, had a big um, journey and that was kind of a, that was fantastic that they were able to contribute in, in that professional way. Great. Uh, we just wanted to quickly show you the, the output of what we developed. And this is our Kids Helpline service map developed alongside all those young people who participated in that and address some really key pain points in the design, particularly around the weight experience. So that's something we really designed for. We, we heard a lot from children and young people about the wait time to access a counsellor, either on the phone or in web chat. Um, and so we're developing ways and systems and um, creating new um, weight experiences for the young people using our service. So that was a, a key thing that we designed for. And the other thing was around those callers who are um, more familiar users of our service and a big frustration of theirs was wanting to reconnect with their regular counsellor. So I'm not sure if, if people in the room are aware, but a Kids Helpline, you can um, choose to speak to the same counsellor on an ongoing basis. Um, so that could uh, that posed a real challenge for young people trying to connect with that same counsellor again and, and having to wait in the queue in order to get through. So that's something else that we really designed for in this as well. Okay, I know there's we're running out of time, so I won't talk any more about that one. Thanks. Um, so I guess my turn. <clears throat> so it's some of the expected impacts of the Kids Helpline redesign. So as Carly's just flagged, uh, improved wait time and wait experience for users. 
we are looking at introducing a new crisis text line. Uh, that's not happening just yet, but it's, uh, it's something that we intend to trial. Um, we want young people to have the ability to book appointments uh, and do that potentially through an online portal. So they will have uh, basically be able to log in uh, to an online portal and find all of the resources that they like to use there or store them there, um, have things like a safety plan, access plans, uh, whatever is relevant to them personally. So uh, that will be a big change, uh, especially for our familiar service users. Improved staff experience with more efficient technology. Um, we're going to be having a new customer relationship management system or client relationship management system. We're looking at using bots for smart triaging and user matching to staff, uh, staff's nuanced skill set. So if we have staff that have um, specific expertise or um, interests or qualities uh, and uh, we have a, a young person contacting us who uh, would connect well or match well uh, with that counsellor to be able to connect them. That's our goal. Um, improvements to back of house systems and procedures. So many pain points and frustrations here for our staff. So we're looking at um, some changes around the workforce structure, our planning systems. And we are looking at um, potentially having a volunteer workforce for the first time. So Kids Helpline has always been a fully professional workforce. And I think we're almost alone in the world in that um, because I think just about everybody else utilizes volunteers in one way or another. Um, so we are going to be investigating that and um, yeah, I'll leave it at that for the time being. Um, and up to Lena to talk about our Good Design Award. <laughs> yes, sure. I think um, what I might do is in the interest of time, uh, I do want us to get a little bit more talking about the progression from the call facilitation part into yeah. the paid um, opportunities and how that all worked out. So I'm just going to really actually, yeah, kind of skip over that. I mean, so we want an to award. say that... Yes, we won an award and the, the biggest, I think, icing on the cake um, was really that uh, one of our co-facilitators, Jamie, uh, was able to be there with us. So you see them um, in the photo there, very proud, it was just last week, actually. And, you know, I think for me, uh, I've won, uh, I do, you know, humble brag, um, I've won uh, two good design awards before. So I, I, for me, it wasn't new, um, the whole kind of experience, but it was wonderful being there with the whole team where it's actually a different sector and design was the first time that your town has, um, well, I think even defined uh, its work as, as being in the design space. Mm, so, um, yeah, so for me, it was just really uh, kind of a, a, a lovely, lovely moment of uh, sharing that experience that, yeah, you are one of the best in Australia, you know, it, um, it was a gold award. Uh, so you should be proud and, you know, continue this journey. So, um, yeah, I hope it's given the team confidence to, to continue on that path. Um, so what I want to segue into now, though, is that um, we set ourselves a challenge as a team uh, once we uh, wrapped up the uh, Kids Helpline redesign, which is a huge success, endorsed by everybody and, and so on, um, and, uh, you know, supported across, across the organization, really. Uh, we set ourselves a challenge to up uh, kind of the, the, the ways of working for the next um, project which is an even bigger one because that's mental health in school. So uh, Kids Helpline has a Kids Helpline at School program uh, or service um, and a couple of other things sort of surrounding, a couple of other services surrounding that ecosystem, uh, which um, as part of uh, thinking through Kids Helpline, we recognize that, uh, you know, we really need a systems approach looking at the population level, at the community level, as well as the individual level. So therefore, 
um, all of these services, they really have to work together. So no point just having kids helpline and not having anything at school kind of connect to that. Um, you know, we could probably do a separate session just, just on that uh, whole ecosystem work. But um, what we also wanted to do as part of this is recognizing that we want to build that capacity in um, young people in their communities to be involved um, in, uh, I guess, mental health literacy, as well as, uh, you know, where possible in redesign work um, or in, you know, taking ownership of the services that they receive. So for us, the uh, one way to do this was to um, train young people to uh, be able to then continue working in the field of design. And um, so we uh, created these positions of um, design associates. And um, yeah, as, uh, as shared before, they have been working with us for a number of months now, uh, learning and very strongly contributing uh, to the work of um, a designer and are doing amazingly well. The other aspect to this is, um, so we are calling them film internships, but it was part of the idea that um, as we tell our stories, that can be a transformative experience and it is actually a part of advocacy. So, um, recognizing the fact that uh, you know digital storytelling and um, sharing views can be a part of contribution to design and to change making and advocacy so that's why we started this um, film internship to give young people the tools to do that for themselves so in the hope that once they've done it yes of course they gain the skills of um, you know filmmaking or get a bit of a flavor and they have a product at the end um, but also sort of ignite that spark around, oh, actually I can, uh, uh, you know, I have an opinion, I can, I can achieve um, some level of change if I um, share my voice and um, share my uh, input. So uh, without um, further ado, maybe um, Carly, I'll get you to kind of in, it's one o'clock now, but maybe just yeah. to sort of wrap up and then we can maybe open for a couple of questions if there's. Yeah, I thank you. We just wanted to to show Seth and Nicoletta here, who we, um, like I said, they send their apologies. They weren't able to join us today. Um, but a real highlight for me in my role in service design project, so for I think 10 months or so now, was seeing these young people employed and being a part of our team. Um, is just something that's been really wonderful and I've um, enjoyed um, being a part of mentoring them and training them in the service design role um, and also seeing them evolve through their time in participating of being not sure, you know, if their views are valid or if, if um, you know, them speaking up to provide feedback was going to be listened to, um, but then towards the end saying, oh, that was a really empowering experience and, you know, I felt really listened to. So I just wanted to add that um, to that and you could see just a couple of quotes from them that they have shared as well. And I also just wanted to show the film interns as well. So another really exciting part of this project that we threw in all at once. Um, so you can see them there. One of the corner pictures has Anne being interviewed. So they interviewed us as a team and they also spoke to um, a couple of young people as well. And the focus of this documentary will be around this service design process that we're undertaking here. So where should I skip up to? Um, Lena, because like we said, we've run out of time. Do you want me to go down to the very end slide? The questions? I feel like we can just open it up at this point, really. Um, okay, yeah. let me just find something to finish on. <laughs> so maybe this one. <laughs> so, Any questions or comments? I'm happy to step in because my, um, my neurons are just kind of exploding. So thank you so much. Um, I'm about to join Department of Education, um, looking at student experience um, in, a, in an area there. So I, my, my first question for, for you and the team is, you know, what, what do you think should be the role of, of the department in supporting kids um, with their own school experiences? So how, how do we best facilitate that best on your own learnings through this project, through Kids Helpline and your interactions with them? Just a little question, yeah. No biggie. Um, One of the things that we heard from um, 
primary school children was that um, they didn't feel like they um, would be allowed to ring kids helpline from school, for example. Right. So, you know, one of the things, and primary school children don't have access to devices at home anymore. There's no such thing as landlines at home. Um, if they want to use a mobile phone, they've got to borrow one from someone in their family. Um, so um, while we have the capacity to uh, provide services to five-year-olds and six and seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds, um, the best opportunity for them to, to contact us is at school. Um, mm -hmm. And so we'd like to see some, you know, more structured approach to providing um, direct access to our service from schools. It's one thing. Lena? I I'd be happy to speak separately, Anne. <laughs> yeah, my perspective is that um, having worked with the Department of Education in, in Queensland and you know Children's Hospital and so on, my um, perspective is that uh, it's a lot of it is around um, capability building in the workforce and um, really giving, say, in, in your example, potentially, whether it's policymakers or, or teachers directly, um, bringing them on board and giving them the space and time to actually do this core design mm -hmm. type of work, I guess. Because, um, I mean, what we uh, know innately, but what we also try to practice is that it's not, uh, it's often not us as um, outsiders coming in and doing the work, but it might be um, teachers that kids see every day. So we are not necessarily always the best to conduct, um, you know, research or engagements or co-design mm -hmm. uh, things. So that's that's the first thing. And the second thing is, I would say, uh, kind of patience and um, extended timeframes, I would say, because I think this capacity and understanding and desire to do more of this comes over time. It's not a one time engagement. It, it's actually, you know, working and building relationships over time. True, true. thank you. But yeah, keen to hear about your work. If you want to get in touch after, it'd be great to connect. Yeah, I'd love to hear. I can ask more. Um, you spoke about the train because honestly, my, my head's exploding, but I don't want to take over the conversation. So um, <laughs> tackle uh, uh, other others on the call, please tackle me. Um, I had a, I actually had a specific question about the training materials that you developed. So training others in facilitation, co-design practices, particularly when it's kind of like people with lived experience so folks out in the field mm. is a bit tricky so are are mm. the training materials developed for broader distribution or were they something that was quite tailored for what you needed in the program mm. they were very tailored and um and they were also very low-key so appropriate kind of for the audience i would say that the because your town and uh, the profession of counseling um, has such a strong uh, kind of ethics and practice framework already. There, a lot of the things, you know, I didn't have to, I, I come from a research background, so, uh, you know, I'm quite firm on ethics and those sorts of things. I didn't even have to explain any that meant because the team already was practicing that anyway. So a lot of the safeguards and kind of assumptions that I often have to bring up with clients, it was all there, you know, everything was already prepared consent forms and remuneration and, you know, safeguarding and um, having a debrief session um, afterwards available and those sorts of just good hygiene practices uh, in terms of design, they were already all in place. And um, so the training itself was probably, yeah, I would say it was very informal and it was also tailored to how the young people um, needed it or what worked for them. So for example, we started out on mural that didn't work for um, some young people because you know on mobile might not have been great for them to access it. So we did it in different ways. We followed up individually 
um, with them. And so it's really, because of the number is quite small at the moment of young people, um, we were able to do an individualized approach. Like Carly, you can share more about working, for example, with Seth and Nicoletta, our associates. Um, you know, there are some uh, limitations to their participation, whether it be for health reasons or other reasons. And um, I guess we could afford that both from a skill perspective. So we know how to, as a team, how to deal with those sorts of unexpected things. And also, I guess, from a philosophical and, and, and just support perspective, we were just able to jump as a team. So if, for example, one facilitator couldn't make it, because they didn't have a good day or whatever, then we always had someone else to jump in. So it's it, it's kind of, I think, around building a shared relationship and um, yeah, I'm not sure that I'm using the best words here, but Carly, please jump in. And, uh, yeah, okay. I'll just say that it was that it's very individualized, but it, it's um, with it being a, a smaller um, team, that's been easier to implement. So whatever, that young person is comfortable with and whatever pace they're happy to go with. So some young people in their co-facilitation sort of training were quite nervous and just wanted to sort of listen and maybe did some chat in the chat boxes. Other young people were more engaged and wanted to actually co-facilitate. So trying to identify where their level was at or where their goal was at and working individually with that young person to achieve that goal. Yep, meeting them where they're at. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great summary. Um, Ash, I think you had a question. Or you put your hand up. Yes, okay. thanks. Thanks, Leanne. And thanks, Anne and, and team. I I was just thinking about um more the kind of the what's like with all this work that y'all are doing and modeling to the sector and, and perhaps everybody else who's working with young people like how are you like how is that actually kind of transferring to your peers in this space in, in the way you're modeling this for yourself yeah any stories but, on that one thus far yeah i mean intention uh, yeah and and um carly can jump in from my perspective um what we're uh well, it's early days, I would say, and uh, um, you know we've had a huge learning curve um, in a very uh, short amount of time. So the the journey is to scale this up and make it a continuous part of your town and of your town practice. And so, for example, we already started working with the evaluation team um, on how to get young people um, as part of defining how evaluation is done. Um, just to give you one one flavor, there's um, now uh, the implementation team for your town is looking at as a so there's a whole technology stick kind of transformation that's going on. Um, young people will be a core part of uh, how that is tested and prototyped and so on. And so there will be separate projects that will continue this approach. And in terms of giving back to the sector, we're hoping to establish a community of practice to do more of this, you know, have, have more of this dialogue and learn from others and um, as a, yeah, as a community, keep doing more of that. Particularly for the NFP sector, yeah. But what's the kind of role for the people who actually hold the purse strings, like the government who's probably funding a whole bunch of things for y'all? Like, how are you working backwards to, to them to actually shift their commissioning models for the rest of the nonprofit sector? Oh, that's a big one. Um, That's a really hard question to answer. I think that we, uh, by demonstrating what's possible when you engage young people properly uh, in these processes, um, we hope the government will see that you know this is the way forward. There's been a lot of you know lots of tenders that come out require co-design, but I don't think there's any understanding of what co-design really means in practice. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know you'll you'll get a, a requirement to you know co-design uh, a program within three weeks. Um, uh, where, you know it's uh, so I think I think that um, yeah um, this think, is a slow uh, this yeah. is a slow burn. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm, I'm I mean whilst we talked about the ethics of engaging people at this mm. particular point, I'm talking about the ethics and the integrity of what you're learning and mm. what that means as a collective to influence funding bodies to shift. So yeah, going the other way back up. But yeah, thank you so much for your reflections. Yeah, great work and great modeling.
Um, but I, I also think that um, what I didn't know before I started working with your town is that actually the majority of uh, kind of funding is not from government for your town. So there's actually awesome opportunities, you know, with partnership models and um, communities and things like social enterprises, uh, where I think what, well, what I'm really interested in alternative models that uh, kind of make us a little bit more independent of the drip. Of yeah, I mean, I think I'm more interested in, that's great that you become independent, but also kind of holding the rest of the, the groups to count mm. in the way children move through the many sort of places that they interact mm. with. Mm. So I think that's what I'm trying yeah, to get absolutely. at is to say, you know, as you kind of grow and evolve in this, kind of that mm. sort of uh, accountability and responsibility to to kind of the wider system that we kind of keep playing in, so to say. So yeah, it's more from that. But yeah, it's great. I mean, I think b better to be not dependent if, if possible, but um, I think whether you're mm. independent and you're fully funded by yourself, that will be fantastic, but you'll still mm. be in interfacing with a pretty powerful um, context of the government. So I think that will be an ongoing relationship, whether you like it or not. Yeah, 100%. I mean, one of the ways that we're addressing it just for this um, piece around um, mental health at school um, is actually, maybe we can bring up that slide or, you know, you'll, you'll get it when kind of we send it out later on um there is kind of the uh engagement level at a population level um this is specifically around mental health but essentially building um capacity in communities and around mental health literacy i and, just quickly chuck that up that's a service model yeah. that we're looking at yeah so the different levels lena's talking about sorry oh. didn't mean to interrupt you can continue lena <laughs> No, I should not be talking about this. You should. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I got away with not having to. Um, oh. Yeah, so just reflecting that we're looking at um, not just working with the individual and their family, but trying to engage with community and build partnerships and also from a more population level. Um, and I suppose that's where our advocacy research team um, has input into that wider population level in, in trying to feed back up to, to government. But um, I don't think that's exactly what you're talking about either, Ash, but maybe the, all these little pieces sort of adds to it. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Um, I think maybe we should go, but I'm, again, apologies for the little error with the Zoom link, um, but glad that there are a few of you that could still make it later. I'd love us to put our, our cameras on if we're willing and do a bit of a jazz hands clap for um, <laughs> Selena, for Anne and for Carly. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you all for coming. We've raised $300 as well for a mm -hmm. So thank you all for your contributions and I hope to see you again soon for another Social Design Sydney.